All right. Yes, I'm good. All right. Welcome, everyone, to this uh, first instance of our series uh, on uh, frontiers in monitoring supported decision making for structures and infrastructures. Um, as most of you are aware, monitoring and generally data collection provide um, enormous opportunities for enhanced decision making. But the installation and design of monitoring systems and the collection of data more generally can be costly and, and are often not targeted towards optimal decision making. So often one sees that data is collected relatively, let's say, naively, and one hopes that the resulting information and, and knowledge will somehow be useful for decision making. But um, unfortunately, this is not always the case. And it can also be difficult to convince owners and operators of the, the potential benefits of monitoring systems. So if one wants to do that, one has to really assess the decisions that are triggered by the monitoring data throughout the life cycle. And, uh, and I guess the, the general question behind all this is how can monitoring provide the most value? And these type of questions and, and, and also finding strategies to enhance monitoring supported decision-making are what we want to discuss in this speaker series. The series is organized by Elena e. Hatzi, myself, Daniel Straub, and Antonis Camariotis, who is actually doing most of the, the work in organizing it. The series is organized with the support of the Institute of Advanced Studies of the Technical University in Munich. And if you wondered why we have an abbreviation that is called uh, DDS for this workshop, then it's because the, the, the research group that we have there is called Data Informed Decisions for Structures and Infrastructure. That gives DDS. Good. I don't want to spend uh, more time in this introduction. Um, I just want to say that this is the first of six events uh, for which for each of which we invited two leading experts in the field. Each event will be one and a half hours. The speakers have a total of maximum one hour for their presentation and, and their ideas. And then we have a 30 minutes discussion session. Um, for contributing in the discussion session, please use the chat and or the Q&A. You can put questions and comments during the talks, and Eleni and myself will then moderate the discussion and we'll pick up your questions and comments, group them together and put them to the, to the speakers. If, in some cases, we will also allow some of you to ask your questions directly. Those are the rules. Ah, finally, I should say that the event is also recorded and will be afterwards made available on the event website. But that's now all from the organization. So I will hand the word to Eleni who will introduce our first speaker. Thank you, Daniel, and for also setting the, uh, the guidelines for how to ask the questions. Uh, it's my pleasure now to introduce the first speaker for today, and that is Maria Pinali Mongelli, uh, who received her PhD in seismic engineering at Politecnico di Milano. She's currently an associate professor of structural and seismic engineering at the Politecnico di Milano. Her research interests are in the field of structural health monitoring for civil structures, including vibration based damage identification, and works on the topic of this uh, seminar today the value of information for SHM in relation to standardization. She is an active member with leading roles in several committees and associations in the domain, including uh, Ishmi, Fried, uh, the APSE, and several others. And I have the pleasure to work with her on several of these committees. Uh, she also serves in the editorial board of a number of journals, including the Journal of Civil Structural Health Monitoring, uh, Engineering Structures and Infrastructures, and she participates with a leading role in several national and international funded uh, projects on seismic and structural health monitoring. And I think a lot of this will go into the discussion of today. So I will uh, offer her the floor and look forward to the presentation. Uh, thank you, Eleni, for this uh, presentation. And, uh, okay. 
no, sorry, I have to change here. Otherwise, can you see now? Yes, it looks good, full screen. Okay, great. Um, so uh, thank you for uh, this presentation and thank you also for the opportunity uh, of uh, giving this, uh, uh, this talk uh, on uh, this, uh, this topic, which is very interesting. Uh, first of all, as Daniel already said, because uh, um, monitoring system provide uh, today a huge amount of data that can support decision making. Uh, and so this is a very uh, topical uh, subject, but also because uh, uh, it is interesting that um, approaching this topic requires uh, a mixed expertise. And from the list of, uh, uh, of uh, presenters and uh, of uh, topics that will uh, um, be treated during the, 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 the list, uh, the, the, let's say the series of webinar, I've seen that uh, you managed to, to really mix these two words. Uh, decision analysis and monitoring. And so, uh, and uh, I would like to, um, let's say, address this topic, this talk on uh, standardization of SHM from the same uh, perspective, uh, which is, uh, uh, let's say, the integration between uh, uh, these, uh, these different words that in part uh, is uh, ongoing, is mature, but there are still some open uh, uh, research questions uh, and so still some efforts that need to be done to, um, to, to bring uh, this topic uh, into a full uh, standardization. Uh, so I will start this talk with uh, describing some documents that already exist uh, on uh, uh, SHM, uh, um, uh, SHM, Structural Health Monitoring. And then in the second part, I will address some open uh, research questions. So what is still missing from standard documents? Uh, first of all, I would like to define what I intend by structural health monitoring, because also the definition of the term sometimes uh, um, is um, different from persons, from uh, experts, from different words. Uh, I intend uh, uh, SHM as a process that continuously uh, manages information relevant to the uh, performance of, the, of uh, the structure. So this process includes um, uh, the, the acquisition of data, the transmission, the processing of data to uh, extract information, and then the transmission of this information to the decision maker, who uh, chooses uh, a management action. This last part, of course, doesn't, uh, let's say, strictly speaking, does not belong to monitoring, uh, but I think it should be included in the monitoring process, not least because the design of a monitoring process must start uh, with the definition of the process uh, that, uh, let's say, of the uh, management problem that uh, monitoring is meant to, uh, to support. And so this part should constitute a, a part of the process of the monitoring process. Uh, now, uh, SHM, uh, despite uh, the several uh, su successful applications and uh, the many efforts on uh, behalf of the researchers, is still uh, is not yet uh, um, extensively used. And uh, among the, the several reasons that uh, uh, might have played a role in this situation, I think there are two uh, main uh, problems that uh, uh, Daniel already uh, mentioned. First of all, uh, and they are summarized by, by these two questions. Uh, uh, the first one is, uh, uh, does uh, uh, SHM has a return over investment? So um, for a long time, uh, still now, uh, there is a sort of skepticism uh, in, um, of owners and managers, people that manage, uh, manage the structure and have to decide about uh, the benefit, let's say, or about the uh, possibility to install or not a monitoring system. There is a difficulty to uh, estimate if this uh, really brings uh, um, a value. And this must be done before installing the, the system. So uh, up to some years ago, uh, the a methodology to, to perform this was not available. And in the last uh, years, uh, there was this, uh, the construction that Sebastian uh, coordinated and probably he will uh, describe it more in details. Uh, and in the realm of this project, a, a framework for the evaluation of the value of information was, was developed. And this in perspective, I think will uh, uh, 
uh, will facilitate the diffusion of this system. Uh, the second problem, and I will talk more in detail about this, is uh, I think uh, related to the insufficient knowledge uh, and understanding of SHM system. Um, this um, right now, for example, SHM is not included in uh, the master curricula of the civil engineering schools. And so this, uh, let's say, makes this, this topic a bit a, a topic for experts. Uh, in this respect, the standardization of uh, the SHM pr uh, process can really uh, facilitate uh, uh, the, the, the adoption of this system because standards can provide uh, knowledge and consensus about this system. And uh, this can build uh, confidence and, uh, and the trust on the uh, benefit this system can can uh, bring. And of course, all this will uh, facilitate the development of a homogeneous criteria and so facilitate the adoption of the system. So let's start from where are we now? What are the existing documents? I will describe some of them, uh, of course, and those that I think uh, have some interesting uh, uh, aspects. So these were uh, the ISIS uh, guidelines of, for structural health monitoring were uh, published in 2001, so 20 years ago, uh, by the uh, Intelligence Sensing for Innovative Structures Center. And um, this document uh, uh, is mainly, uh, as I, I have to say, many other documents that were published later, mainly uh, is, is focused on how to acquire data to provide a diagnosis. So with respect to the process that I described earlier, it covers the first part, up to processing for the diagnosis. This guideline um, doesn't uh, um, address expi explicitly the uh, use of information to support decisions. It seems uh, as if the two processes are somehow um, distinct. There is the process of acquiring data to uh, assess the condition of the structure, and how to use this data to make a decision and to intervene on the structure, if needed, is not considered. Um, what is interesting of this document that the process is defined, the, the monitoring is already defined, but not, not as a testing method, but as a process that uh, includes uh, the management of uh, data and information. Uh, five years later, uh, the SAMCO project, which was a, a, a European project, delivered another guidelines. Uh, uh, this is a more comprehensive document that uh, describes several testing and uh, assessment procedure. And with respect to the previous, is more focused on continuous monitoring. The previous was more, uh, uh, let's say, concentrated on periodic monitoring. Uh, however, also in this document, the focus is still of, uh, on diagnosis. The, the goal of monitoring is to detect the damage and to reduce uncertainty, of course, but um, the aspect of decision making uh, is still, uh, uh, let's say, not, uh, uh, it's, uh, um, there is some uh, uh, hints uh, on this, but it's not uh, really detailed. Uh, what is interesting here is that the first time, for the first time, is addressed an aspect that I think is very important. Sorry, I don't know why it changed. Okay, uh, which is the um, qualification of test personnel. It, this is interesting because somehow it addresses the aspect of data quality, of the quality of the information that are acquired by monitoring system. And of course, here is still a bit related to a more traditional way of acquiring data, which is through visual inspection or not destructive testing. Uh, but still, it's a very important uh, topic. And uh, this is the first time that is mentioned. Uh, some years later, uh, in Austria, we published the first technical code. Uh, this was published by the Austrian Federal Ministry of Transportation. So it's not a guideline, but uh, is a uh, technical uh, document, a technical code. And uh, the interesting of this document that uh, has a part on the technological aspects of uh, uh, monitoring is that, again, there is a, an aspect about data quality uh, related to the monitoring staff. And also maintenance is uh, mentioned, which is an important aspect, especially when the cost of the monitoring system is, is, is uh, uh, evaluated. Here, for the first time in this document, uh, is mentioned that, that uh, monitoring must be included in life cycle ma uh, management. So 
In this case, the, the, the goal of monitoring is not only the condition assessment, but also the prognosis to manage uh, the structure uh, uh, across life cycle. There is no any description or details on how to do this, but the concept is, uh, is already here. Uh, this is the only technical document, as far as I know, uh, that has been published, uh, issued outside uh, Europe, and this is, it is a Chinese uh, uh, document. Also, this one has been uh, issued by the ministry, so it's, uh, it's not uh, a guideline, but is a, a document with a legal um, um, aspect, let's say. Uh, and. Uh, uh, this document uh, uh, is only about data acquisition. Of, uh, it details, uh, uh, it gives indication on how to design a, a monitoring system for different types of structure, but the process, the monitoring process is not uh, uh, tackled. And uh, uh, of course, the, the, the use of monitoring for diagnosis and prognosis is not uh, included in, uh, in the document. It's a technical, really uh, focused on technical requirement. Uh, this is a very interesting document that doesn't deal specifically on SHM, but I think it's interesting because it deals with an aspect which I think is uh, very, very important for uh, um, the monitoring process, which is the um, the definition of protocols for data management. This document is in process, is a, a, was issued in 2016 in the US for NDT and visual surveys. And is a collection of uh, forms and of protocols that indicate how to manage data, how to collect data, how to store data, how to, uh, not yet how to process data. This part is still in, pro in progress, but they intend to propose uh, uh, these uh, protocols. And I think this is a very, very important part in any, uh, that should be included in any uh, standardization document. Right now is not uh, uh, that, it's not like that. Not, uh, protocols are not included in the documents that I, I've uh, seen, only in this one that is not on, on SHM, but will be. Okay, this is the first, uh, at my knowledge, document that addresses the, the entire cycle. Is a, an Italian document was, was issued by the Italian Standardization Body in 2016. And uh, this document, first of all, addresses monitoring as a tool for, to support a diagnosis and prognosis. Uh, it describes in detail uh, the uh, hardware, software. So all the technological aspects and the processing uh, uh, method are, uh, um, are described. Uh, but I think that what is really uh, interesting of this document is the clear and uh, uh, definition of the monitoring process as a process to support decisions, support decision both, both from a diagnostic and a, uh, prognostic uh, point of view. The last two documents, uh, these last two documents are very interesting because they, they consider um, monitoring from a different, completely different point of view. Up to now, all the documents consider monitoring as a um, tool to support condition assessment or, uh, uh, let's say, performance assessment to, um, uh, let's say, life cycle management. But uh, without uh, um, a specific focus on decision making. This document was published in 2019, so it's very recent, by the Transportation Research Board in the US, and is completely focused on, uh, on decision making. Monitoring is defined as uh, um, the goal of monitoring, as to assess the structural performance to inform decision and must provide owners with a return of their investment. This is the first time where this concept is uh, uh, clearly, uh, clearly addressed. Uh, however, in these documents, there are only no indication on how to, uh, to sorry, on how to uh, estimate uh, the return of overinvestment. It is said that the owners should uh, um, perform a preventive risk analysis uh, considering different monitoring system to understand which one to choose, so to optimize the choice of the monitoring system, but there are no indication on how to do this. And the last document is 
let's say, has a, a similar approach in, in the sense that uh, this defines the aim of monitoring as to support decisions relevant to uh, efficient integrity management. And there are the three guidelines of the post action I mentioned before. But uh, contrary to the previous document, in this document is provided uh, a, a, a method, a framework uh, to, uh, I, I swear that I, I, I don't touch it, but it changes, mm -hmm. okay. Um, uh, it provides a framework, a method to uh, quantify the value of uh, uh, monitoring of information or monitoring information before the deployment of the system. So somehow this solves the problem that is not considered in the previous. Uh, as a summary of the, all these documents uh, um, that have been issued in the last uh, 20 years, uh, and there are others that I didn't, uh, I didn't describe, uh, uh, and there are also international uh, standards, uh, the, the ISO. All these documents, uh, um, let's say, uh, uh, describe or provides uh, uh, methods and rules on how to assess the structural condition. Some of them mention, like the Austrian uh, uh, document we see, which is here, mention the, uh, that monitoring can support uh, asset uh, management. However, they don't uh, provide information on how uh, to do this. The latest document, the two documents uh, issued in 2019 are uh, completely uh, focused on decision support and they don't uh, provide description on the technological aspects or, uh, or monitoring on how or how to, to assess the structural condition. Uh, there are some documents, this blue one, that include uh, bo uh, both aspects. Uh, uh, these, are all, uh, these three are all uh, Italian uh, documents. Uh, there are probably more. These are the documents that I know. This is a national, these are national guidelines published last year, and these are regional guidelines that uh, uh, were issued last year as well. Uh, in perspective, there will be uh, the, the, the harmonized standards that are under preparation in the framework of a, of a research project, a coordination and support action, the I am safe uh, project. And all, so all the most recent uh, documents see the problem from a different perspective, which is not only assessment, but also support to decision for asset management. And I think this, uh, uh, I see this evolution as a shift in the monitoring perspective and objectives that uh, occurred in the last, uh, in the last uh, years. Uh, and this shift, uh, uh, let's say, follows uh, somehow the shift of uh, perspective in uh, uh, the management uh, uh, of structures. From a condition assessment uh, uh, perspective that addresses mainly safety, um, due to the uh, current situation where resources actually are not uh, uh, enough to, to address uh, the problem from this point of view, uh, the, the, let's say the perspective that is that of optimization of resources. So uh, now monitoring uh, is meant to provide information to support performance assessment. So also forecast of the future performance in, all, in order to optimize uh, uh, maintenance. So somehow, uh, there was a shift in the last year from structural health monitoring to what I would call uh, a structural performance, uh, um, performance monitoring. Uh, so this is the current situation, what is included in standard. Uh, and uh, uh, there are still uh, open questions. Uh, one of them is how to perform uh, pro prognosis, because this is not included. Even in the documents that mention it, they don't describe how to uh, uh, include, uh, um, let's say, performance models in, uh, um, uh, in asset management procedures. But uh, beyond this, uh, there are other, other uh, questions uh, that I will try to uh, describe. Um, first of all, there is uh, the, the definition of the process. The definition of the process, I think, is not completely clear. Uh, because as I said in the beginning, uh, the uh, monitoring should be triggered somehow, uh, let's say the, the, the process, the design of monitoring should be uh, triggered by the decision problem. And this is very clear in the uh, documents uh, that address uh, monitoring from a decision support uh, perspective, but not in the, in the others that actually describe how to design a monitoring system. 
Uh, and I think that the, the design of the monitoring system should be uh, addressed in this way. So first of all, define the management problem that the information have to support. Uh, then a conditions to survey, to understand uh, what are the de deterioration, the degradation phenomena that affect the structure. From this, uh, we can understand which performance indicator we need to describe this phenomena. Uh, we, uh, based on the performance indicators, we need to uh, estimate, we define the measurement to do, the monitoring strategy and the information management process. Because as I said, Monitoring is a process that includes all this. So performance assessment, which means diagnosis and prognosis, information management, which is um, a, a, a very critical point, especially for continuous monitoring system that produce huge uh, amount of data that have to be managed almost, uh, well, not almost, <laughs> automatically to be effective. And then there is the decision analysis part. So. And this process that we intro actually we introduced in the regional uh, guidelines for monitoring, uh, I was mentioning uh, before, uh, regional means uh, uh, Lombardy region. Uh, this was a joint project between uh, Regione Lombardia and the Politecnico di Milano. We addressed the problem in this, in this way, somehow merging the approaches that are present in the existing guidelines. Another important problem is the fact that uh, since uh, um, uh, as I said, uh, this, uh, the, the monitoring process requires uh, uh, the integration of several different uh, disciplines. Right now, there, are, uh, there is not a unified uh, glossary and there are uh, terms that are used in some sectors and not in others. And even worse, there are terms that are, have a completely different meaning in different sectors. Just to make an example, uh, system identification from uh, uh, people that work in structural health monitoring means a procedure to extract uh, um, information about uh, the characteristics of the system uh, uh, to extract damage feature, for example. For a person that works in decision making, system identification in decision analysis, system identification means the definition of the system uh, for which the decision must be uh, done. So it's a, a different meaning. Uh, or another example, exposure. For, for people that, risk, uh, that work on seismic risk, uh, exposure are the consequences, the direct consequences. Uh, in in uh, the, the, the joint code of structural safety, exposure is the hazard, which uh, in seismic risk is called hazard. So there is really a, a need to uh, mm. talk the same language because otherwise this integration becomes very difficult. And to this aim, this cooperation and coordination project like post action or the IM safe uh, coordination and support action, I think are really good chances to uh, achieve uh, uh, an integration. Second important topic, I, I already mentioned it with respect to, to uh, the, um, the expertise required from the personnel that performs monitoring. Uh, in this case, for, for uh, automatic uh, monitoring system and automatic management of uh, uh, information, uh, the, the aspect of quality of information is not enough considered. We are used to consider uh, quality in terms of correctness, which means precision and accuracy. This is uh, uh, obvious when we talk about measurement, but there are other aspects that are not uh, considered and for which metrics and models uh, do not uh, do not almost almost do not exist uh, here is a list of the aspects of uh, uh, data quality uh, actually the the cost action the guidance for scientists of the cost action addresses this uh, uh, this uh, topic but there are not metric and not models uh, uh, proposed. And there is only one paper, I, I forgot to, uh, to mention it here, it's a paper by Michael Faber, where there are, there are some models uh, uh, proposed. But of course, this is a topic that really need uh, to be addressed, not least to, uh, uh, to uh, perform a value of information analysis that accounts for different uh, quality of, of data. And uh, to this, uh, to this uh, topic is also related uh, the quality of the indicators that we use. And uh, um, uh, mainly, and uh, in particular for 
structural health monitoring process, uh, let's say systems that are based on vibration-based monitoring, uh, there is a huge problem related to the validation of uh, uh, indicators. Um, these indicators are global. They provide information about the, the state of the entire structure based uh, can do, this indicator can do this uh, even using one single sensors sensor if there is a change of frequency we can say under certain conditions that there is a damage uh, and this indicator of course can be tested simulating data on numerical models for example but this leaves this indicator at a very low mat maturity level if we in, in, a cost, in another cost action, the Q1406, a couple of years ago, we uh, made a survey on uh, indicators uh, trying to understand what was the maturity level of these indicators. And we used a scale which is similar to the um, TRL scale, which is used for technology. We applied, we used it, it for indicators. Indicators read it in this level, it was called the scale. So from the, the lowest level, which is basic research, which means that the indicator is in the mind of some, uh, some researcher, up to the um, highest level, which means that the indicator is systematically applied. And there are several levels which uh, indicate the use of indicators in conditions that are closer and closer to real world conditions. So most of this, uh, uh, um, well, let's say the, the, the more mature of this vibration-based indicator couldn't go further than uh, apply the, the level TR, uh, TRL, which, let's say ERL uh, seven, which means applied on real specimen in its environment. But actually this indicator was, were not really uh, applied on real specimen or better. They were applied on real specimens, but data was simulated, was artificially simulated, cutting a beam, removing concrete, because for this uh, type of, uh, of indicators, it's really difficult to get data, not least because owners are not so available to provide data relevant to a damaged uh, bridge. So uh, this is one of the problems for the, these indicators, uh, which is very different uh, uh, with respect to indicator of corrosion, for example. For, the, for those indicators, we found the uh, IRL level nine, which means systematically applied, because in that case, it's very, uh, I mean, it's very, it's, it's more, uh, is easier to acquire data because they are acquired on um, local uh, region portion of the structure, and there are a lot of data on corrosion. So this is a problem. A similar problem is related to the, uh, the, pro the fact that uh, we need to account for environmental effects because environmental effects have a strong influence on uh, this vibration-based indicator, indicators that are related for, to, let's say, uh, mainly mo modal parameters, uh, parameters, dynamic parameters. And uh, here, just to, to show you an example, this is a, an acceleration extract uh, measured on a bridge. And this is the uh, results uh, are the modal frequency extracted from this uh, uh, acceleration. Uh, the, the, the variation of the model of the, I don't know, five modal frequencies uh, extracted from this signal. And as you can see, it's very clear the effect of temperature. Now, since uh, damage is uh, identified based on the variations of these uh, modal frequencies, it's obvious that if we don't account for the variation of temperature, it's impossible to, uh, well, it's, it's very easy to confuse a uh, uh, variation of temperature with damage. So these, uh, uh, these effects must be considered. But again, it's difficult to have data uh, that uh, uh, contain this effect of environmental variations and as well damage. And also in this case, we keep using data artificially uh, produced. Uh, I think all the researchers that work on this have uh, used the data uh, produced on the bridge Zeta 24, uh, I, I guess, uh, 20 years ago. Because uh, again, it's difficult to get some data. In time, there are some, uh, there are more and more monitoring system and more and more data. But still, the, the, the situation is difficult. And the same uh, problem applies to the definition of, of thresholds that allow to distinguish a damage from an undamaged configuration situation. Last uh, problem, uh, last uh, 
let's say, open question is related to the integration of monitoring information in assessment or design procedures. Uh, here, for example, is reported uh, a table uh, which is uh, contained in, the Itali in some Italian guidance for the uh, seismic risk mitigation, where are uh, um, proposed a sort of resistance uh, safety factors that are used to reduce uh, the resistance of uh, um, materials if information are available. More information are available, the lower is the value of this uh, uh, safety factor, which means uh, that highest, uh, higher resistance can be considered. Uh, there is nothing about monitoring. Uh, these are information from documents or even from tests, but are uh, really uh, laboratory tests or even on-site tests, but uh, non-destructive, uh, very basic tests. And there is nothing about monitoring. And this is something on which we should work. This is a similar, uh, uh, a similar uh, uh, document. is a Canadian document where uh, uh, at the increase of the level of inspection, which means uh, more details, more information, a uh, lower value of the um, target reliability can be used. And some researchers are proposing a fourth level, which corresponds to information from monitoring. Uh, so there are proposals, but uh, uh, not included in, uh, in document. So uh, the last, uh, very last thing, uh, uh, we need the documents that includes all the several aspects that I, I described, Diag diagnosis, decision support, protocols, and possibility to include uh, um, consistently uh, the, the, the availability of information in the, let's say, safety factors for the design and assessment. So to conclude, to conclude what is the situation of standardization. The general, the general objectives of standards are to ensure competitiveness of industry and the standard we have uh, tackled this, this part because they provide information, uh, let's say standards about technological and also economic aspects. Safety of people is addressed because they are mainly focused on condition assessment. Prognosis and optimization of resources based on monitoring, uh, both in uh, uh, management of the business of structures and in design is still a, a work in progress. And with this, I, uh, I have uh, concluded. Thank you very much, Maria Pina. And for now, I would like to ask the audience to uh, put any questions in the chat, uh, which we will keep for later for the for the final uh, session. And I will give the floor over to Daniel, who will introduce the second speaker. Yes, so please use the chat or also the Q&A, whatever you prefer to make comments and questions. And I'm happy to announce the second speaker of today, who is Sebastian Turns. He's a professor in Lund University in Sweden. And he's also affiliated with the BAM in Berlin, the German Federal Institute for Materials Research and Testing. Um, Sebastian has been working extensively on the question of value of information of uh, health monitoring and, and how to quantify it ever since he did his uh, PhD in ETH Zurich. And as was already mentioned in the, by Maria Pina, he was heading the incorporation action, the, the cost action TU1402 on the value of information of health monitoring. So who is better placed than Sebastian to talk about this topic? And I look very much forward to your talk. Thank you very much for the introduction, Daniel. I would uh, like to talk about uh, when I have arranged my windows here, sorry, uh, about the value of structural health information uh, towards uh, standardization and innovation. So we, in terms of value of information, of structural health information, we need to talk towards standardization because it is not standardized yet. Um, and there may also be a way then to innovation. So I would like to talk about both uh, topics from the side of uh, value of information analysis 
in regard to structural health monitoring. So uh, the first part is basically the activities towards standardization, and this is uh, association work and scientific networking project work. Uh, this has already been mentioned. There was a working group in the cost action tier 1402, which run from 2014 to 19, where three guidelines were developed one guide for operators, one for engineers, and uh, one for scientists. Uh, this is how we termed it a few words afterwards. To that end, out of the guide for scientists, a JCSS background document has been uh, developed. So uh, to the cost action to you of one, four, or two, where we heavily worked on quantifying the value of structural health monitoring or the value of SHI, structural health information. And we uh, noticed basically that uh, so once we understood uh, how we could uh, quantify the value of structural health information, we noticed uh, that um, where the uh, others and uh, the engineers and operators of infrastructures, um, they uh, had some difficulties uh, to, to, follow, uh, to follow us uh, because we spent much more time uh, here uh, on figuring this out and setting up the probabilistic models and writing scientific papers. But uh, this is not uh, the best way uh, to make it easily understandable. So uh, in this sense, and one part of making this field accessible was guidelines, um, and we wrote one for infrastructure uh, operators. So and here the basic idea was, uh, what should infrastructure operators and owners ask for? Uh, they should not just ask for a, a structural health monitoring system, but a, a utility optimization of infrastructure by structural health information and before implementation, uh, not uh, if the uh, system is already there. So uh, this is uh, key and we have seen that uh, this idea has uh, also been taken up in uh, US or uh, we don't really know, uh, developed in parallel. So this was a talk by Maria Pina. Um, a guide for, for engineers uh, here, uh, our uh, aim was for engineers with some background in probabilistic modeling. How could they do um, a, a value of information analysis? Um, and uh, we uh, developed here a case study for that. And the guide for uh, scientists, this is how we called it. The basic idea is how to make this uh, field more accessible and to develop uh, consistent approaches for the formulation of um, yeah, structural health monitoring, structural health information uh, approaches and modeling and how to utilize this information for the structural performance. So um, let's have a closer look in the uh, JSSS background document on quantifying the value of structural health information for decision support. Uh, we um, have basically uh, here an analysis part uh, where we describe the foundations of the value of structural health information, analyzes uh, how to model a decision scenario consisting of um, a structural performance model of um, physical actions um, and of uh, information and of uh, utility consequences costs. So this is all what we need to put together in this decision scenario. And uh, then we linked this also to other uh, JCSS documents with the system utility consequence and acceptance criteria modeling. This is the uh, risk assessment and engineering document. So this uh, part here provides basically uh, the links. Um, then we uh, describe the structural health information itself with the classification. Uh, the probabilistic characteristics um, and SHI uh, cost modeling. The core, um, which provides an, some accumulation of the scientific literature until 
I must say, until 2019, um, is uh, to try to uh, develop here consistent approaches for different types of structural health information. So damage detection, load testing, monitoring, uh, damage detection is basically also inspection. Inspection is local damage detection. Damage detection on system level um, would uh, be with uh, acceleration sensors and then using, for instance, um, yeah, on, on the structure uh, acceleration sensors. So uh, we, we are then have, uh, we then have information on system level potentially, um, and we would uh, also need the damage detection uh, algorithm. Um, so, okay. Um, and we also account here for non-destructive and destructive testing, equality information modeling, another approach. So, um, well, this is the first session on uh, value of information and structural health monitoring. Uh, so a few words um, along the guideline, uh, the JCSS background document on uh, the value of structural health information. We have the objective functions uh, here. We have a basic decision tree I already mentioned that uh, for a value of information analysis, we need the uh, models of the information. This may be uh, here different strategies we can decide about. Here with the decision nodes, uh, we may have for each of the strategies uh, different outcomes. Uh, so this is a progressive model uh, node here. Um, and we have here these branches, this is different outcomes. We need a model of the risk and integrity management for our structure in terms of actions. Uh, yeah, we can choose for the optimal action, repair, do nothing, uh, or uh, replacement of component, for instance. Uh, then we have the system model and the um, system states, uh, which is another progressive model, and this is linked then uh, to uh, utilities, uh, meaning uh, benefits, costs, and uh, consequences. So these are all the models uh, we need, and we have the, um, the three decisions here, basically. The very basic decision is here whether to employ um, an SHI system uh, or not. Um, uh, and this is uh, actually uh, here leads to the objective function, the basic objective function. So we are subtracting basically the result of this decision tree uh, with the result of uh, this decision tree. And we see uh, what stays is the uh, information. And this is actually the, the value of information. Um, and what we subtract is the expected value of the uh, utility. So, um, and uh, this is done. Uh, pre posterior so we do model uh, with the help of our prior models the outcomes the potential outcomes of uh, an shi strategy here for one and this is the outcomes uh, probabilistically so we predict this uh, and we have a predictive modeling pre posterior modeling of the uh, information If uh, the situation is that the information is already there, uh, then uh, there's one decision left, which is optimizing the actions. Uh, and we see here that there's uh, no point in uh, choosing another SHM system or SHI system, uh, but the information we have is subjected to uncertainties. So that's why the circle uh, stays here. So, and uh, the last point here, uh, boundaries. So here we account for prefer preferences uh, of a potential decision maker or uh, life safety boundaries uh, can be accounted for here, depending on uh, the uh, yeah, comprehensiveness level of the decision analysis. So if we explicitly model this, uh, then we may not need the boundaries, uh, but for most cases, we uh, would need the boundaries and need to comply with uh, uh, 
life safety requirements from codes and standards like a target reliability, for instance. So this is an um, example of, um, of limit state function. Uh, it's basically uh, R minus S, uh, but accounting for the model uncertainties uh, of the resistance and of the uh, loading here and also the deterioration, this, this term here. And if there was uh, model uncertainties, uh, they may be uh, exploited. So the way of determining model uncertainties is, is a prediction by a finite element model of the collapse load of a beam uh, with a point load. So you go in a laboratory, have uh, 10 tests, and you will see that uh, the uh, laboratory results will vary. And uh, to come from the uh, yeah, deterministic prediction to uh, the real uh, output, uh, the real collapse load, uh, this is the model uncertainty. So the other way around means if there was a structure, one uh, could uh, try to uh, measure uh, here, for instance, uh, straightforward uh, with strain gauges, for instance, the loading model uncertainty, the realization of uh, this model uncertainty. But we cannot account for all the realizations, so um, we can uh, somehow make uh, some boundaries. For instance, this uh, Z2 indication could mean uh, that the structure, the stresses in the component here, this is a C uh, component, uh, are as expected. So uh, our model uncertainty lies in between. So there is a probability for that uh, by integrating over the uh, with, uh, within these boundaries or uh, the PDF, the probability density function. And uh, if we do want to account in the limit state function for this information, we uh, use the truncated uh, distribution and account for the measurement uncertainty or the SHI uncertainty MU here. So this was, this was it. Uh, I, eliminated the slides because I was anticipating that Maria Pina uh, talks too long. It was a joke. Uh, I didn't expect this, but I, uh, I've taken out the slide anyway. Good. So let's move to the second part, uh, technology development support. So we have already seen uh, that technology readiness was uh, adopted uh, in Maria Pina's uh, talk to the indicator readiness. So uh, where there's something uh, for the relation of the technology readiness uh, to value of information analysis. So basically uh, we know here this uh, TRLs very well. Uh, they have been introduced, I think, by, by NASA uh, some 20 years ago. And um, then they have been taken up by the by ESA, the European uh, Space Association, and also by Horizon 2020. So uh, well, we rather know uh, this very well. It goes to basic principles uh, to then the technology is ready to actual system proven in an operational environment. So um, what we uh, did here, uh, there's a paper. Uh, the reference will come later. So that is, uh, we could um, also classify the readiness of our models. We could think of a decision value. So this is a generalization of value of information, a decision value forecasting where we use generic models. Uh, but not just some models, but generic models, which are also related to code calibration, for instance. Um, then the second step could be uh, if our models have been experimentally substantiated, then we have a value analysis and the technology value quantification could be uh, in an operational environment. So, and this is uh, what we thought about um, 
So uh, here we have this uh, different decision value analysis, value forecasting, value analysis, technology value quantification. And this can be associated to these uh, steps of technology readiness, uh, feeding in, feeding back. Um, so uh, one group is tier L1 to tier L4, uh, where the technology is validated in lab. And then uh, there's another step uh, here uh, where it goes from the lab to the relevant uh, environment. And then to the, to the last step is the full um, operational environment here. So um, I will talk a little more about the uh, value forecasting approach. So we take a generic uh, performance model. You've seen this in one of the previous slides. Uh, here it is the uh, resistance um, relation to the damage uh, is a little uh, more explicitly written. And we may have indications, uh, high performance indication as expected or low performance indication. And uh, we can, uh, and this is what we postulate, or generically um, also model, uh, get information on this model uncertainty, resistance, damage, and loading. So we can uh, get all these uh, uh, information here uh, from the individual model uncertainties. So this is an extension of the basic idea of uh, Reifer and Schleifer with perfect information where uh, the exact system state is known uh, without uncertainties, but we do it a little more realistically, but with the generic modeling. Um, and we also have uh, decision uh, rules derived here. Um, and uh, here, these thresholds, they are calibrated to uh, target reliability. So this goes to the boundaries I've outlined uh, previously. So when we uh, do this, uh, and, we, uh, and we, if you do a little more and do also what I've talked about, um, then we uh, may end up with these three diagrams, uh, loading, resistance, damage, uh, the um, beams here, are uh, the value, uh, and then we have the probabilities here on, on the right-hand side, and these are the dots. So for instance, for loading information, um, I have a high probability of obtaining DZ2, so as expected, um, performance as expected indication, and uh, this is associated to uh, here, this, posterior expected value of the utility without taking into account the precision of the information. And here uh, it is with the uh, precision. So there's an influence you see here. So we can do this for the loading, for the resistance, for the damage, and for all three indications. Accumulating this, um, we so uh, this is also the thresholds uh, we have documented here. Uh, this would be the uh, related pre-posterior uh, value of, um, of information. And we see the highest uh, value of information uh, comes from the uh, load. And uh, this stays also after um, we account for the so imperfect information for the information uncertainties. And uh, what we see here is the difference between the optimal uh, strategy to the other strategies. Um, and uh, we see here that resistance information uh, has a rather large difference, uh, the, uh, not so good side, um, uh, but uh, we see here a large difference, but um, when we do account for the precision of the information, then we see that this uh, difference is um, lower here. So that means for our generic system, we should go for load information and damage information. And that means we should, now we have done the analysis and we should go then uh, to the technology and research screening. So which technologies would provide us with load information and damage information. So, and then uh, this should, uh, this is an input for TRL1. So, uh, various basic principles we could exploit. So, this would uh, then uh, focus the research 
on the uh, on the technologies providing the information with the highest potential value. And what is even underlying here in this analysis is that uh, innovation is uh, about technology, but also about creating values. Yeah. So we we go uh, we guide in a way uh, that we focus the uh, technology development uh, towards high value. So this is the underlying idea here. So this brings me to the uh, summary and conclusions. Um, so the value of uh, structural health uh, information is uh, somehow uh, yeah, in the stage of guidelines uh, in scientific associations. Uh, there may be a few more we have seen uh, in the uh, presentation by Maria Pina. Uh, I have uh, also introduced a joint approach for technology readiness uh, development with the three phases support by value of information analysis and uh, I have shown here a very uh, small example. So thank you for your uh, attention. Hello. <laughs> Thanks again to both speakers. And uh, now is the time for discussion. There have been a few comments and uh, already raised and uh, partly been answered in the Q&A session. Mm, maybe if I may, just to, uh, just to bring up the first point and then we can also start looking also into what other people's uh, in comments. Um, so, you, Maria Pina, you were talking about standardization guidelines, and, and the I guess the challenge in the standardization is that you can do it at the it's the level of detailing that you choose. Uh, so, you can do standardization at the at the, at the high uh, yeah, high level. So not too detailed, but then often it's hard for, for practitioners to, 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 re, to relate it to their specific problems, or you can make it quite detailed. Um, but given the fact that, that I guess SHM is still used in, in extremely different contexts, that's probably challenging to, to achieve. Uh, what, is, what are the, uh, the I think that docu this is documents a... that you, you discussed? Uh, well, the document I discussed, except the, the Chinese technical guide, which is, uh, let's say, specific for the type of structures. Uh, so it provides uh, instructions on how to monitor uh, um, a bridge or a building or, uh, let's say, a, a long span uh, a bridge. Uh, let's say, consider several typologies and for each uh, a type of monitoring. All the other guidelines actually do not uh, uh, propose a strict rules on how to uh, design a monitoring system. Uh, and I think this is uh, uh, typical of a, uh, typical. This is the only way to go for a civil structure because uh, which makes, uh, I think, a standardization of uh, monitoring for civil structures more challenging with respect to other types of structures like, such as mechanical or uh, aeronautical structure, because in, in this case, in the case of civil structure, actually you, you are trying to standardize the monitoring for, a, for something that is not standard, which is a civil structure. Each bridge is a, a specific, uh, uh, is different, is, uh, is one single structure for which monitoring must be um, designed. So I think uh, uh, guidelines should propose a method a method and of course uh, for a method for the design of the monitoring system, a process, a, a method to design the process. Then there are things that should be very details, uh, as I mentioned, the protocols for data management, that should be strict, I think, and very detailed. Because for example, uh, if you forget the metadata in a file uh, of data, you can easily exchange uh, data on one bridge from a, to, with data um, recorded on another bridge. And this uh, would uh, uh, 
I mean, <laughs> with uh, really confused uh, things. So the protocols, I think, should be very strict. Also because uh, the, the process is automatic, it should be automatic for structural health monitoring. So uh, I, uh, this is what I... To ask in this direction, since you mentioned this, do you think that uh, coming up with a library of typologies, because you know every bridge is different and I agree, but there's many concrete bridges in specific um, national highways of a specific number of spans, of a specific age and a specific material. Would this help in this direction? Yeah, uh, yes. S said what I said, that of course there are, uh, let's say, most common bridges uh, for which today monitoring is not uh, used yet. Yeah. Uh, because uh, today are only large bridges, strategic structure, landmark structure that are monitoring. Pro possibly due to what I said, uh, owners are, uh, are not able to, to estimate the return of the investment. So they, they don't, uh, simply don't use monitoring, don't, they don't decide. But you are right, I agree. Uh, in Italy on the highway, highways we have, uh, I don't, tons of bridges which are yeah. the same of the Similar. same type. Yeah. So uh, yes, it could be done. It could be done for, uh, but when, um, I mean, uh, monitoring will become uh, a more, uh, I mean, a reality, a, a more uh, a concept, uh, structural monitoring, a concept that is accepted uh, at large scale, I think. And in that case, uh, yes, I, I think, uh, um, definition of monitoring for typologies could help um, mm -hmm. even if uh, and maybe sebastian can say something about this uh, i think uh, the monitoring system should be also optimized with respect to to the the typology or the specific bridge uh, in terms for example of value of information so um, there are the two things uh, in part uh, uh, could be that the typology could be could be repetitive but also uh, should be optimized uh, for some aspect for the specific structure maybe since you gave the floor to sebastian i add on to this a question from the audience that was asking whether uh, the voi framework should include the condition of the sensor the health of the sensor itself because oftentimes there are possibilities for faults in the sensing system even is for Sebastian or for me? For Sebastian, uh, giving it over from your <laughs> yeah, question, yeah. just to add on to this, also the perspective, not just the positioning of the system, but the fact that it can be faulty. How to yeah, take yeah, this yeah. into account? Yes. Yeah. Uh, thanks, Eleni, uh, for this question. This is actually about a slide I, I took out. <laughs> and, <laughs> okay. uh, and this is uh, this goes to the very important um, part of uh, yeah, precision or uncertainty modeling uh, of uh, the sensors. So, um, yes, it is very important that we know how precise the sensors are, uh, or even more uh, substantial, uh, that uh, they are healthy. Um, so this is uh, extremely uh, important. Um, and this is actually part, and this is part of the guideline uh, also, uh, but uh, on a qualitative level. So um, we would be very happy about uh, quantitative uh, models for, for this. Mm -hmm. Which could be offered from specifications, I guess. Mm -hmm. I think this is one of the points uh, when I, I describe data quality, information quality, one of the qualities is the completeness of, uh, of information. So uh, when you miss some data, e either because uh, a sensor is broken or because uh, it's temporarily uh, doesn't transmit data, which means that the transmission system, which happens for wireless sensor, for example, and uh, you don't realize that uh, you don't have data uh, or uh, you don't have a model, uh, for example, to simulate this in a value of information analysis. This is a, a, exactly the, the, the case that we, right now, uh, we don't have model to, to model it. So mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a very important point, I think. You mentioned, Maria Pina, that uh, the, yeah, the Kind of the, it's hard to convince uh, the owners and operators to, to install these systems. Um, but how do, do you think that by, by, by doing a, a theoretical analysis, showing the valid information, which is what we're trying to do, uh, 
Is that sufficient? Will that convince them? Or isn't it that we need to convince them by, by, by showing real, real life case studies? And I also look at some comments that, that were posted in the, in the I, chat I definitely related to we... asking for real, more, more real examples. And I guess that's much more easy to relate to also, for, even though they are anecdotal often. Huh? Uh, well, uh, in the cost action, we made uh, 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 I mean, a large effort to produce case studies. Uh, to, uh, this was exactly the, the, the idea because the, the theoretical framework, I have to say, I am, uh, I mean, ex external of the world of value of information. I was, uh, let's say, when, uh, when the cost action started. And it was, uh, it, it's a, a, a theoretical framework, which is, uh, um, very interesting, but it's very difficult. So for, for owners, uh, uh, we definitely need applications. We need to show uh, what is, uh, how, how does it work? Not even how does it work, what are the results? This is what we have to show, that there are results and, the, the, and the, there are cases in which uh, the information is useful, uh, not is useful, brings a benefits and cases where it doesn't. Uh, and this I think should, could be convincing. Um, it is actually, I think. Yeah. Related to that is also a question here that asks if any if aspects of behavioral psychology has been included, or like taking uh, somehow into account that that there are, uh, there are, uh, maybe uh, are not I, always following I, this I, rational utility theory, but they have very different uh, preferences. And, and Sebastian, do we want to answer? Maybe. Uh, Yes, uh, good point. This is uh, also a direction for, yeah, for research um, to align uh, with the preferences of decision makers. Um, and uh, wait, this, uh, um, if you look, uh, if you look to utility theory and prospect uh, theory, this is uh, rather well known in other fields. Um, and it is a potential to adapt these uh, models and there's first attempts in science to do this. Um, I would also see here, uh, there's a little challenge of uh, determining the uh, preferences of uh, decision makers in the built environment. Uh, but I, I would be happy to, uh, to see papers on that. Uh, there are uh, uh, some papers from Daniele Zonta uh, who uh, studied the, uh, well, uh, the, the title of the paper at the end was that the value of information can be negative, uh, which said like this seems a, a bit strange, but actually uh, it was, uh, the, 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 this result came out of the fact that he considered the two different decision maker with different preferences. And so at the end, uh, if the, the, the second decision maker, the one that has to manage a monitoring system that has been chosen by another person and has a different uh, risk, uh, is a risk adverse if the, 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 the other was uh, uh, more uh, available to taking risk, then uh, the perception of the second decision maker can be that the, the, the investment was not worth. And so in that case, there is a sort of a, a psychological aspect in the sense that is a, a, a different, uh, mm -hmm. um, let's say, uh, availability to take risk or not. Um, but uh, uh, to this respect, I have to say that uh, I think there, there, should be, there could be some owners that in any case will not trust the monitoring system. But because, and I say this because there are researchers that have this, uh, um, attitude. For example, when you say, okay, we should include a, a monitoring in the design and consider that information can allow to us uh, to um, uh, consider a lower target reliability, they say, but we cannot uh, trust uh, an automatic system, a, a, a sensor to do this, because they don't understand that the fact is not that you trust the sensor, the fact is that you trust the fact that you reduce the uncertainty with the information. So I, I wouldn't be surprised if an owner would say, no, I don't trust monitoring system, because actually they don't understand that the aim is to reduce the uncertainty, not to trust a, a, a mechanical system, to, uh, to assign the safety to a mechanical system. 
So I would say that this is a psychological <laughs> problem. Um, if I may pose a question from the chat, um, as the next one, uh, is it SHM standardization only a matter of typology of the structure or is it also a matter of the environmental conditions and hazards? Uh, I, I'm not sure I understand the question. Uh, there are two different things, I, I, I guess. The typology uh, can, as we were saying before, ty typology um, can, can drive the, the, the deployment of the sensors, the location where I put the, the sensors. Uh, environmental condition can affect the, the indicators that I extract from the the, the responses of, uh, of the structure. So I, I'm not sure if I, I understood the, the, the question, but uh, I would uh, say that there are uh, really different uh, topics. Yes, I, I think the question is on whether it influences also the type of sensors to use, maybe the hazard to some extent, yes. Uh, but uh, given a specific type of system, given a site where the hazards are expected, then it's about the typology uh, for understanding. Ah, okay. So if uh, yes, of course, uh, it depends on the on what I want to monitor. As I was, uh, I was saying, it depends on the decision problem. Uh, what, what do I want to manage? What do I want to do with this uh, monitoring? Uh, do I want to have to manage emergency due to a, to a, an earthquake? Uh, do, do I want to manage an emergency due to a a flood, do I want to manage maintenance? So depending on what I want to do, I, I um, and depending on what are the condition of the structure, I decide what I want to, to monitor, which degradation or which phenomenon, which damage I want to um, monitor and on which, what information do I want to uh, get from the structure. And from this follows the, the measurements that I have to take and uh, the, the strategy, the monitoring strategy I want to, uh, to use. Uh, regarding the environmental uh, sources, uh, uh, I mean, I, I have in mind temperature and uh, humidity, but they are not hazard, I, I think. Uh, they are uh, environmental condition that may affect the uncertainty of the indicators, as I said. And uh, another more technical question or this is related to Sebastian's talk. Um, it's uh, like, what is the uncertainty level for the calculated VOI when you produce such a calculation? Uh, good point. Very good point. Um, well, there is. Um, there is the uh, utility theory again, um, and uh, which states um, that uh, rational behavior is uh, by maximizing the expected value of the utility. And by using the expected value, uh, we don't really see the uncertainties in the uh, utility. Um, first, um, and we don't see the uh, uncertainties uh, really uh, in the value of information quantification. So uh, this goes to the basic uh, formulation um, and the basis of the decision theory where the information is based upon. Um, well, then uh, this is the first point. The second point is there is a sensitivity analysis uh, of um, the value of information and uh, model parameters uh, which are used to quantify the value of information. But uh, this is subjected to the optimality. So there is uh, a maximization operators. You have seen this. Uh, so this is uh, always under certain uh, preconditions so that we are still optimal. Um, Yes, um, and uh, a third point would be uh, there is uh, two papers with uh, Mark Stewart or myself uh, where uh, we looked a little uh, beyond the expected value um, and uh, quantified something like the uh, significance and effectiveness of uh, decisions. So that's the probability uh, of how much the curves would, would overlap. 
So this could be a way of accounting for the uncertainties in the uh, expected utility quantification um, first, uh, and potentially also for a value of information analysis. Maybe uh, to mention a comment here by Paula, she mentions that the current IEM SAFE project is addressing the aspects of standardization, meaning the sensors, the technology, damage indicators and KPIs. And I think, yeah, it's necessary to have these initiatives. Uh, Sebastian mentioned cost action PU 1402 were a methodological framework for the VOI initiated. Cost action PU 1406 also looked into uh, standardization and initiation of libraries for KPIs and so forth. So I do think that it's through these extensive initiatives that one could uh, place uh, these frameworks forward. Um, maybe just uh, to, to then ask one more question that also gives for, uh, as uh, here we have a, people that are also maybe non-experts in SHM. And there is a question that asks, for example, whether SHM is a, an instantaneous prediction, or let's say just a prediction at the current point in time, or whether it can be exploited also for forecasting, meaning residual or remaining life prognosis. Maybe this is something worth clarifying uh, for the decision context. Uh, yes, uh, so uh, it depends on, the, on how information are used uh, uh, it, there is the possibility with the information from monitoring to, um, let's say, uh, calibrate uh, uh, models of the performance of, uh, of the structure. And um, using this model, uh, you can forecast the, 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 the future performance and so use uh, the information at the end to make a prognosis and to um, optimize uh, uh, maintenance intervention based on the remaining uh, service life. So this is, uh, this is possible. Um, uh, let's say deterioration models uh, related, for example, to corrosion are already available and, uh, and can be used. But as I said, it depends on the indicators and it depends on the uh, type of monitoring. Vibration the indicators that are extracted from vibration-based monitoring uh, um, are more difficult to, um, to use, to be used directly to build an analytical model to predict the, the performance. They, they can be used, let's say, in uh, numerical models, to update numerical models, and then with, with, those, uh, um, with those models predict the, the performance. But uh, again, they are not yet at a maturity level that uh, enables uh, in a straightforward way to, to, to do this. So condition, uh, uh, current condition assessment uh, uh, is easier for sure and is uh, uh, possible. Uh, the reliability of the outcome depends, really depends on the indicator. If I may add here, um, the forecast uh, is in some aspects uh, rather easily based on prior models, which could be, uh, for instance, for fatigue uh, engineering models or a little further developed uh, engineering uh, models uh, of, for instance, fatigue deterioration. So the forecast is overtaken by uh, engineering models. And then uh, this is one part, this is the prior information. And then uh, the likelihood uh, is then based on the measurements. So this is what we usually do in a uh, way of information analysis. The forecast is done with the prior models. Yes, so I see also, as Eleni already said, that there are many also questions. And I think we cannot uh, answer all of them now uh, that are yes coming from people who are not so familiar with, with SHM and, and but and maybe or maybe value of information um, but maybe one question I would also raise here and that is asking for the, whether there's any software with which this analysis you know, can be done and I think we talk about standardization that's also uh, something that nowadays actually get people to 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 use things by by providing software that, that allows an easy use of uh, these concepts 
Uh, there was a software, Sebastian, right, in the cost action developed to perform a very uh, yeah, Actually, this is a question for Eleni and Daniel. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, uh, regarding the benchmark is more of a verification, <laughs> uh, but I would say software like Jimmy or although they're not made for this purpose, can be shown to be used. There was an example by Daniel on using it, correct? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, so they can be shown to be used for this purpose. And we had some examples in the fact sheets. It's correct, as uh, Sebastian mentions. Of the yes, yes, there's something on the on the web page of the TU1 yes. for... Uh, Maybe I can because there's an issue in general that there is general purpose software, as you mentioned, like Genie or, or tools for uncertainty quantification, for reliability analysis that, that can be extended and, and used for... for for assessing in some sense the, the value of the benefit of the DSHM, but but they require a lot of, of, of understanding and, and, and knowledge about probabilistic modeling and things that typical engineers don't have. And uh, they, and what we found, and, and I think what we found also in the DSA in this cost action, thinking about whether how such a software looks, is that it's really difficult to make a kind of uh, one software that, that that fits these very different application cases of SHM. So I guess it would be possible to make a software specifically for dynamic monitoring of, of bridges. I guess there could be potential. Um, still doesn't exist, or as far as I know. Um, but something that is more generally, uh, it's not. It's not. We we don't have a finite element model that that almost. Uh, First year student can use to, to do this assessment. And I think this is also one of the, as you've mentioned before, no, you, it requires really a lot of us, it requires to have knowledge about multiple, multiple areas. And, and, and this is also one of the, the reasons why this integrative view is not is, is so seldomly found. Yeah, but that's one of the structural analysis you need to understand about. The, the, the monitoring technology you need to understand something about uncertainty and, and probabilistic quantification, ideally also about the costs and, and economic assessment. But this is one of the reasons why we need standards, because standards uh, uh, provide uh, uh, knowledge and uh, provide, uh, I mean, a, a line to follow, at least. I'm not saying that tomorrow anyone could do a, could design a monitoring system or could uh, um, perform a, a value of information analysis, but uh, I mean, at standards could at least uh, provide the tool uh, to learn uh, or a guideline to follow. Um, because right now, uh, as I said, there are not even courses in uh, master curricula, uh, at least not not in all uh, uh, universities. Uh, that teach structural health monitoring. So we have a course at Polytechnic in, uh, at the PhD level, but not uh, at the master level. So it's really still a, a, an expert uh, uh, task. Yes, I have to say we introduced such a course uh, about 10 years ago at the ETH, but it's still a specialized, sort of a specialist uh, interest. It's an optional course. But it's not unless we actually introduce these courses in the educational system that probably we will start generating and gen, you know this uh, yeah sure uh, I agree new, yeah new waves of engineers that are somehow capable in this respect. Um, mm. But still, we need standards because otherwise it's a jungle. <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. Because uh, of course uh, you need some base uh, to 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 learn and to know what to do. But um, you need rules also. And, and also, the, the, let's say standards are not enough uh, because uh, uh, standards can provide uh, uh, how to do things, but then mm -hmm. things have to be done according to the standards. Um, I make I, just a simple example. We recently uh, performed a, um, a study on inspection policies in several parts of the world. And Italy is the country that has the best ever inspection policies, inspection of bridges. And Japan seems to have the, I, I won't say the worst, but worse, uh, worse than Italy. But then if you look at the, uh, let's say the state the, of, of bridges, of uh, the bridge asset in the two countries, let's say that, there, that the situation is almost the opposite. So it's not enough to have standards or even technical codes. 
you need to uh, really to 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 apply this. Uh, <laughs> there is there is a further step uh, that it, that it's important. It's fundamental. The standards are not enough. Uh, you need to to uh, force people to apply them. Yeah, but it's also the coming from Germany, where people typically follow the standards. Sometimes, <laughs> maybe, sometimes maybe too much, but. You know, when you're bringing an example of Japan, I guess the difference is, is also the culture. And so one thing is the standard, but it's also the other thing is the culture and is, is, this, is, this, is this willingness to actually, you know, think about the whole decision process. So yeah. It's often also convenient, you know, that you, you are an expert in monitoring system. People ask you to put a monitoring system and that's what you, what you do and you get paid for it. And uh, maybe there is no incentive or culture to to maybe think about the the whole value chain and, uh, and, that, yeah, and, that, and, that, and that goes well for some years until the owners maybe realize they never get anything back from these monitoring systems and then stop paying for it but right, this was what i often observe in at least here in, in my surroundings is that uh, people ask to to have um, Okay, we have uncertainties. We want to collect data, so let's collect data. But then, yeah, they, they don't see the value because they are not thinking it's completely true. But and what do you mean? Do you think that the standard? No, no, the standard, 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 is, standard, is, standard is one thing, but there's also has to we have to develop this culture of um, of performance based thinking and of. Yes, but I think you you all agree on the same. <laughs> yes. uh, I think we're approaching completion, so I don't know, uh, Daniel, if you would like to transfer a last question, maybe to close with from the audience. Yeah, we can take maybe the, the this last question is also the, the last comment that comes here. Um, Not on Antonis's beard need... uh, being, hmm? <laughs> being nice. There is a comment on the beard of Antonis, but I think. This <laughs> 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 I. Uh... <laughs> yes, <laughs> this I will not go into comment, but a second, last, second to last uh, comment, which asks if there is, uh, you know, we need different standards if we think of anticipated or unforeseen events. And, and it's true that this is maybe relates to the fact that SHM can have really very different applications. So one is a kind of anticipated events. And you, you, you know, so bridges develop certain type of problems. So we put monitoring system to check for those. But then you will have also monitoring systems, maybe just as an anomaly detection, or if really to prevent the uh, the black swan event, as is written there. Uh, well, prevent also that, no, of course. Also of that, or, but also maybe it's also maybe another uh, type of application is when you put uh, a new type of structures, prototypes, and you want to you want to learn about how they behave, yeah. but not necessarily for that particular structure, but for the for the whole portfolio mm -hmm. of structures. Which is this is uh, for sure uh, uh, one of the possibilities. The, the Italian uh, uh, standards uh, consider this one of the, 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 the possible application of monitoring, as well as the, the another application is to verify the validity of interve of new interventions. When you strengthen or repair a structure with a new technique, uh, you can use monitor to check how it works. So this is uh, this is another uh, another possibility. Well, the last uh, point from my side uh, to this uh, specific uh, issue here uh, is uh, where there's a way of uh, accounting for uh, events and model them and quantify the value of information uh, and uh, identify uh, an optimal um, monitoring system, uh, but the uh, other way uh, would uh, also be uh, rather uh, go for abnormal uh, uh, event detection. And uh, one uh, example would here uh, this uh, um, skyscraper shaking in Shenzhen happened today, where uh, it's uh, the skyscraper. Scraper uh, started to shake uh, with no reason. There was no earthquake, um, so with no known reason. Uh, but uh, people evacuated from the building. So uh, where well, uh, this is uh, something uh, which cannot be uh, modeled, uh, and maybe it doesn't make sense to uh, 
uh, truly model this, uh, but to be aware um, and to detect uh, simply uh, vibrations um, up in, on an abnormal level in, in, in buildings. Okay, good. I think we, we reached kind of the end of this, uh, of our time, but um, when people who have to leave, of course, can leave, but maybe I'll give the chance to Giuseppe Manchini, who asked to ask a question uh, directly. And uh, since he has, if you allow, and if the speakers have five more minutes. Yeah, sure. Uh, we, we, I will, will just allow Giuseppe and um, so Giuseppe. Yes, I am here. Uh, thank you, Daniel. Actually, it's not a question, but it's a comment for both the speakers. Two comments. The first one is that uh, we have to push in a direction to apply the monitoring on small and medium span bridges. That is up to, to 150 meters, more or less, of span, because uh, there are a lot of bridges, 95%, 99% are in this field. And uh, uh, we have uh, several uh, repetitions or um, just less than 10 typologies on these bridges. Then it is possible to have uh, a lot of data which allow us to use machine learning to predict the behavior of similar categories uh, of bridges, uh, which appertains of course to the same highway with the same traffic more or less uh, and uh, with the same environmental condition. Then this is uh, another value that we have to put on the table because uh, the machine learning uh, may be very important for uh, the maintenance of the bridges. The second is that we need to have uh, to take a position about the results. What we are asked uh, to do by the owners of the bridges or the ways is uh, to uh, fix uh, a couple of results which corresponds to a reduction of safety or if you want to a, an increase of risk for human life. And then we, we are asked to decide what are these results? What is the risk that we accept? Uh, just to make some number, we can say that generally we, our uh, uh, risk for human life, for this sector uh, that we accept is of the order to 10 to minus four and uh, the risk to, uh, for uh, individual uh, uh, loss of human life uh, 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 for distractor is 10 to minus four. For the human life, uh, individual risk is more or less 10 to minus two, or we can consider also for large bridges uh, or long bridges, uh, the group risk then what is? But if we consider 10 to minus four to 10 to minus two is 10 to minus six, when we fix, at what level we fix, we decide to fix the first three salts, which is a source of attention. That is uh, something in the bridge is not uh, going direction that we expect. And uh, what is the risk that we accept when we close uh, the bridge? In my opinion, we have to have a distance between uh, these three salts of one order of magnitude. That is, we can accept to have 10 to minus three instead of 10 to minus four, when we call the attention of the owner and we increase the level of the controls and we have to close when we have a 10 to minus two more or less. Uh, those are order of magnitude because in this case, the global risk for human life is 10 to minus four, which is the common risk which is accepted when you cross the highway to be invested by the car or also in the, indoor activities in the house for uh, uh, accidental uh, uh, injuries in the house and so on. Then whichever are the numbers, uh, I think that this is a necessity to enter on the market saying uh, and, and being clear that we have, uh, we suggest such limits so that the people is informed of the risk uh, with the uh, in use of uh, existing structures. And this can move to use the monitoring uh, extensively to control when this level of risk is reached. Yeah, I, I think uh, 
this uh, requires, uh, uh, at least for vibration-based monitoring, required, uh, requires models of the structural performance because yeah. uh, uh, if, uh, uh, I mean, uh, uh, vibration-based monitoring can provide the uh, information about the stiffness of the structure or the loss of stiffness or damage in this term. So to go from this to an estimation of uh, risk, uh, uh, probability of failure, you need a, a, a model of the capacity uh, of the structure. And this is not straightforward from the, the vibration-based indicators. So um, it, it, I, I agree, I agree that this uh, would be a great achievement. Uh, um, I'm not sure is so straightforward with vibration-based monitoring, which is, uh, I, um, I think, that the, the monitoring system that can allow a, a continuous monitoring as would be needed in this, uh, in this case. Uh, you have to combine uh, dynamic and the static measurements. Yes, yeah. in that case, if yes. You, if that... you combine and you have continuously the, the result of the monitoring, you can arrive to that. In that case, yes, uh, yeah. uh, combining with static and then you, you have information about the strength, I agree. Yeah. yeah, I also agree, but because we're now a bit further away from our end time, I want to give the floor back to you, to Sebastian and Maria Pina, just for your closing statements, let's say, what would you like to leave the audience uh, with? Oh, this was unexpected. <laughs> <laughs> I did. <laughs> <laughs> you know, the fair one, but what would you like to say I that you think is important uh, in this context? Uh, no, I, uh, well, I would just say that uh, uh, I didn't, uh, I forgot to mention this in my presentation, but uh, uh, I just uh, mentioned that there is this I am safe project to, in which I am not involved, but uh, it's a um, coordination and support action, which is very interesting because they are producing harmonized uh, um, standards. Uh, for uh, monitoring safety and, uh, and asset management. And I think, uh, uh, as Eleni already mentioned, uh, this type of, uh, of project uh, are the, I think, uh, I agree with Eleni, are the only way to go. It's, it's a very important project because put together many stakeholders. So it's the way to go to achieve consensus and, and to produce uh, um, guidance. So it's, uh, it's very promising and, uh, I'm very, let's say, interested and excited about this project. Mm -hmm. So I think we are on the good track. And for uh, Sebastian? Yeah, well, uh, I found the one slide I've deleted I want to show you. No, that was a joke. Yeah. Um, so uh, I just uh, want to uh, thank you for setting this up uh, and your hard work in organizing uh, and tools uh, also for making this possible. And uh, thank you very much for the interaction uh, in these uh, almost two hours. And uh, thank you uh, to the audience for the uh, very good and con constructive uh, questions. Yes, thank you all. And uh, I'm very glad that we had so many questions and it took two hours because, <laughs> because it was, uh, I mean, it was very interesting. Thank you all also for organizing and for the questions also. Yes, yes, thank you. Thank you. Uh, very much for your willingness to participate and uh, unfortunately we could not answer all the questions um, but uh, okay, some of the questions will be answered in future discussions and talks and i just want to mention that the next uh, event is on june the first so this is uh, i think a tuesday um, and will be on uh, artificial intelligence driven optimization of monitoring and maintenance policies and this will be uh, by Janie Nielsen and Kostis Papa Constantinou. I'm already looking forward to that as well and from my side yes stay safe everybody and bye bye thank bye. you for joining and have thank a nice day bye thank, thank you. you bye bye, bye.